something sinful, you, do, you we should regret it. We should feel very guilty about it. We should feel sorry about it. That can help us to remove the reactions. Hmm? Sometimes, say, like Krishna consciousness and religious uh, organizations in general are criticized for, in, you know, making f people feel regret, you know, sorry for that they commit, they couldn't follow, you know, be up to standard, and then they can't leave because they, they, you know, then they, they would seem, you know, so how, what would you answer to such a? Or we make people feel bad. Yeah, we make feel people guilty. feel bad that you know, that guilt. you know, guilt, very guilty, you know, or, and you know, in a, mm -hmm. a position where they. We shouldn't tell the truth to them, right? We should hide the truth. We should tell them, no, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, we have to speak. We have to speak the truth. We have to tell people that what they've done was not proper. And only in that way can they learn and can they hope to change and improve themselves. If we don't, if we don't tell them these things, they'll never learn. They'll just think, well, it's okay, it's all right, nothing wrong, no need to feel bad about it. Have a seat, Prabhu. That's okay. No need to feel bad about it, just do what you feel. <laughs> Not something that is just nonsense to think like that. There, there used to, there was this one person, maybe, uh, oh, now he's, he, there was this one person in Pune, he was called Rajneesh. He died, and after he died, his followers changed his name to Osho. Have you heard of him? No. Yeah. A lot of books, I mean, he wrote a lot. He was a professor in some university in India in philosophy or in something, and he wrote a lot of books. And he, he was such a rascal, such a nonsense person, you know, and he had so many followers, because he would just tell them, do what you feel, you know, don't try to suppress your feelings, just do what you, what feels, you know, don't try to suppress yourself, just do, and all these people used to go to him, you know, so many people taking drugs and alcohol, and there were so many scenes there outside this ashram, young people. Oh, it was, there, there were so many scandals, you know. Eventually he ran away from India, he went to America and he had so many Rolls Royces, he had so many big cars, and he was living in luxury. And he was avoiding India because the India government wanted him to pay tax. <laughs> and he ran away. And then he, he died already. But he used to talk about, to do things like that. He was just, used to say these things. Oh, don't feel bad about it. You know, just do what you feel like, you know. No, we, we have to tell, we have to speak the truth. That there are certain activities, certain standards of behavior for civilized people. There's a certain standard, certain activity by which we're supposed to, people should act. And people who are cultured and who are civilized, they will come up to that standard. They will follow these, that, that kind of level of behavior. But people who are uncultured, who have no, no control over their mind and senses, they've never heard the, they've never been educated, the, then they act like that. They, and, and they don't have any feelings, they, do any, they don't care what they do to others. They have no feeling of guilt. You get these people like that, that you know, they're, they're robbers and murderers. And, and they come to court, you know, and they, they don't feel any guilt, they don't feel any... 
they don't have any feelings for the people they robbed or the people they injured or even killed. So what kind of people is that? You know, they, they're, they're just, they're, they're not really civilized human beings. They're just like animals. They're like wild animals, right? Just like if a lion or a tiger attacks someone and eats them, they don't have any feeling, they don't have any guilt about it. But that's the difference between animals and human beings. That human beings have feelings, they have emotions, <coughs> meant to consider what we've done, what are the reactions. So Diti was thoughtful and she lamented, she genuinely felt sorry for what she'd done. And at the same time, she had also faith in the Lord. She had faith in the Lord, that there is, is the Supreme Lord, and she wants to please Him. And she has also adoration for Lord Shiva, and for her husband. So this is important. So although she had acted in the wrong manner, by approaching her husband and seducing him at that inauspicious time, she had, she, Kashyapa saw some good in her. He saw the wrong, but he also saw the good. And he explains to her that because of her good aspects, she would have a grandson who will be a great devotee of the Lord. And that devotee, of course, is Prahlad. And Prahlad will have the Mahabhav. You have great, the greatest love for the Lord. He will see the Lord everywhere, in everyone, in everything. He has that vision. And he sees, he doesn't make distinction between friends and enemies. He has that that kind of mood, that kind, this kind of quality. He's such a great devotee. Although he's coming from such a demonic father, he has such wonderful qualities. And you can see it's because of Diti, because his grandmother has such good qualities. Not just the mother and father, but the grandmother. The grandmother also plays a, gets some credit there for the qualities of the son, the grandson. And then Kashyapa describes the different qualities of Prahlad. That's the, the chapter, chapter 14. Qualities of the, the pure devotee, Prahlad. And he has these qualities from birth. He's displaying all of these qualities. It's not like he's cultivating them. He's not a sadhana bhakta. He's a prema bhakta. He's got that natural love for, for Lord Krishna. He can see Krishna. He can see the Lord everywhere. And he's kind and compassionate to all living entities. So, in this way, Kashyapa is explaining to his wife that you'll, there will be this grandson who will be a great credit to your family. All right? There are some quotes from Prabhupada. Kashyapa had been glorifying the position of his wife and women in general. And he said, the woman is considered to be the source of liberation. 
for a conditioned soul, the wife is considered to be the source of liberation because she offers her service to the husband for his ultimate liberation. A faithful wife is supposed to cooperate with her husband in fulfilling all material desires so that he can then become comfortable and execute spiritual activities for the perfection of life. That is ideal family life. Srimad Bhagavatam describes seven canto, right? There's a chapter, ideal family life. The wife will serve her husband. She will make all arrangements for the husband's material desires. A nice home, keep the home neat and clean and tidy prepare food for the husband and the husband he makes arrangements for the other things but generally the woman's position is like that that when the husband when the husband sees the home is neat and clean and the children are taken care of the family are happy then the husband doesn't have any anxiety and he can focus on his spiritual duty at the same time, he has the opportunity to give his time to spiritual practice because the wife is taking care of all the material duties. She is a better half. Woman is the source of liberation. This is one point. Oh, read verses in first verse, verse 17. Wrote, so, husband and wife should cooperate for spiritual advancement. <laughs> Sometimes we do these things in the classes, like in Mayapur, we have more time, we'll get the devotees to perform these kind of dramas how people should, husband and wife should cooperate for spiritual advancement. Of course, cooperation is necessary, not just for material prosperity, but for spiritual advancement also. If the husband makes spiritual advancement, then certainly the wife is also making great spiritual advancement. They make progress together. The husband goes back to Godhead, the wife will follow her husband, she'll also go back to Godhead. This is a Vedic culture, it's like that. The wife follows the husband. Of course, we, nowadays also you get cases, you know, the wife is a devotee, the husband's not a devotee. We get a lot of cases like that. Other countries, you know, I don't know about here. Do you have this in Sweden? You get couples like that. One person's a devotee, the other person's not a devotee. You get women especially, they, they're very, want to be devotee. The husband doesn't want the wife to practice. You know, very, very difficult. So very difficult. How to help them make spiritual events? What can you do in that situation? The wife wants to be a devotee, and the husband's not. The husband doesn't want to be a vegetarian. Either. What do you do in these situations? How will you advise people? You get, get a divorce, eh? find a new husband. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, there was one case like that, uh, um, Hare Krishna would he, he uh, advise the wife to not divorce, but stay together, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess it's a difference from 
in different situations. But certainly Prabhupada never told anyone to leave their husband. But we just tell people, this is your karma. You know, this is your karma that Krishna has put you into this situation. You have to accept it. Because at the time of your marriage, you were not a devotee. Now, you know, later on after you've ma been married for some time, you've met devotees and you want to be a devotee. But at the time of your marriage, you were not a devotee, and you married a man who is not a devotee and who has no spiritual interest, no spiritual culture. So you have to accept it. You have to go along with it. And you have Lord Ch when Raghunath Das came to Lord Chaitanya, Raghunath wanted to join Lord Chaitanya's movement. And Lord Chaitanya told him, don't be a sahaja. Don't take everything so cheaply. Go home and behave like a normal person. And keep Lord Krishna in your heart. So we can tell people like that, that even though your husband is not a devotee, that you can keep Lord Krishna in your heart. Your husband goes out to work during the day. You've got time to practice Krishna consciousness. During the day when he's gone, you can be chanting. You can also be hearing, reading the books. You just have to be careful. I know an example in another country that uh, it was the opposite, that the man uh, has a husband is a devotee, and the wife not. And then when, when the children grow up, then the husband left the wife. So what do you think about that? Was it uh, well, uh, wrong by him to do that? Or? Well, the children have grown up, the husband left the wife, what does he do? Where so did he, he go? He remarried. Take, take another wife, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not really very good. Yeah. That happens, of course. We don't we don't encourage Prabhupada certainly didn't like divorce. He didn't he said that divorce should be abolished. He did not approve divorce at all. But at that, that there were cases where Prabhupada had told the boys, go and get a, take an, another one. The one can happen. Some people, Prabhupada told them, get, find another one. So what goes on in the West, in the West something quite different from what happened in India. Or even in India today, there's a lot of divorce. But it's, it's not ideal. It's rare that the man comes. It happens sometimes. Some men come without the wife. Some, often one will come in, and then after some time, if they're faithful, then the other party will come in and also become a devotee. You, they just have to be patient and tolerant and encourage. And if they're really uh, married, if they're really, if the marriage is successful, then the one party will follow the other. And like the husband will agree to the wife and he will allow the wife and he may even become also himself devotee. I try to encourage people in this situation. I say that being a devotee means you should be a better wife. It doesn't mean you should despise your husband, but you should be a better wife to your husband by being a devotee. You should take better care of him and serve the home, serve the family better than before. They often feel, you know, people feel that, oh, you, you, if you go to this 
place, you go to this room, they'll get all your money, they'll take all your money. That's one fear, you know, that they, they may want, you know, that they're, they're going to spend a lot of money or give a lot of money to the society or to the, to the institution. So sometimes men, they have that kind of fear for the wife. Or the wife may be cheated, or she may be, uh, be she may be exploited by other men even. And so you know there can be that kind of fear from the the man. He's concerned for his wife. He wants to protect her. And some men they don't like the wives to go out of the home at all. They like the wife just to stay at home all the time. They should never go anywhere alone. And so, okay, the wife stays at home. She can also be Krishna conscious. She can chant. She can be a devotee. She can practice. So cooperate, there has to be cooperation between husband and wife. Marriage is for co op you have to cooperate together. You get married, you live together, you have to cooperate with each other. But the point is cooperation for spiritual advancement. That's a higher principle of cooperation. So helping each other make spiritual advancement. Just like you have children, and maybe the children, you know, when they're young, you, you can't, it's <coughs> difficult to go and sit in class because the children can't sit so peacefully. They want to run around, and, you know, they're very active when they're young, and it might be difficult for them. So the wife will say, tell the husband, you go to class, or the husband may say, I will take care of the children, you go to the class today. Like that, that helping each other make spiritual advancement. Mm -hmm. The husband agrees to take some of the responsibility to help looking after the children so that the wife has more time to chant her rounds or to go to the temple program. That would be an example of spiritual cooperation. Right? Can you think of some other examples? how you can cooperate together, husband and wife, for spiritual advancement. How would you, how do you do it? Reading together. Reading. Reading together, yeah. yes. Very, very, very nice, it's very good to read together. Cooking Sunday feast together. Cooking a Sunday feast together. <laughs> <laughs> Cooking the Sunday feast together, yes, it happens, very good. I encourage people reading together. I say, don't just read, but discuss together. You know, reading, we don't want to just make a reading exercise. We're meant to discuss. We're meant to explain these things, you know. It's not just only reading. Some people read, and then what did you read? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, they didn't read that. They, they were reading, but they didn't take anything in. They didn't understand even what they were reading. So it's important for us, Prabhupada said, more important than reading is discussing together and explaining these things with, to each other. That certainly helps. It makes you think more about what we're reading. Because we do have that tendency that sometimes we will read and we just read and we don't think about what is being said, what is actually being taught to us. So it's important for us to discuss together, explain, and make a habit. Prabhupada had difficulty with his wife when he was, of course Prabhupada had a family, five children, and he had, but his wife wasn't interested. He would organize programs in the home, but the wife wouldn't come and sit. So he knew, he knew the difficulty. But if you can, 
if you can read together, that's good, that's a good start. And then develop it to, to, to also discuss together what is being taught. And cooking, Janishwara Prabhu says, cooking the Sunday feast, doing service in the temple together. Okay, very nice. Any other, how do husband and wife cooperate together? We do different services together, like we have a newsletter we do together. Like what? Newsletter we do together. Really? And Write the newsletter together? Sometimes we have school groups here, then we do together. I cook for them, he is doing the lecture, for example. Uh-huh. Okay. You can invite people to your home also, to home programs together, and uh -huh. bring people like that. Yes. We don't do so much, but sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. no. You don't cooperate with <laughs> <laughs> But you do, right? She goes, she's going to the art market with you. Yes. Right? You, know, you cooperate together. You take her to the art market. It yeah. helps, helps you. Yeah. Better half. <laughs> You know, I'm sure you do much better when she's there than if you were to go on your own. <laughs> yes, I know. It's the same everywhere. I know many couples like that. They do their business together. And the wife, she does most of the sales. She's, you know, because the ladies come. She's the one to talk. So, very helpful. Okay. Husband as a class cannot repay their debt to women, either in this life or in the next. Even if they engage themselves in repaying the woman throughout their whole lives, it is still not possible. <laughs> uh, Prabhupada, when he writes in this purport, he says, this is definitely an exaggeration. <laughs> he said, anybody who talks like that, he said, they must be a very hand-packed husband. <laughs> Prabhupada took it as, he said, this is a joke. <laughs> Just to, to give talks in such an exaggerated way about the position of the wife, it's, <laughs> it's an exaggeration. We'll just try to finish here. And then he had talked about Lord Shiva, right? Lord Shiva was mentioned. Lord Shiva being very kind to the ghosts. Bhutanath, right? He's Bhutanath. He's the Lord or King of the ghosts. Bhuta Bhavana. Being very kind to the ghosts sees that although they are condemned, they get physical bodies. He places them in the wombs of women who indulge in sexual intercourse, regardless of the restrictions on time and circumstance. When I was discussing this text with one class, one girl said to me, she said, Oh no, I don't believe this. She said, I know people who have had children without marriage, and the children are very nice, you know. <laughs> she said they couldn't have been ghosts. <laughs> but it, it mentions here that he takes the, these ghosts and places them in the womb of the women. It's not just from the physical body that you can understand who's been a ghost in the, in the previous life. You know, people may look... They may look very nice, but doesn't mean that they were not ghosts in their previous life. We have to look at the subtle body. We have to understand the nature of their minds and mentality. So regardless of the physical body, there's a subtle body. People who commit suicide, Prabhupada says, two kinds of suicide. There's killing the subtle body, and killing the gross body. Kill the gross body, 
then you become a goat. Kill the subtle body, you become an impersonalist, Maya body, merge into the oneness. Impersonalist, they're killing us, they're also committing suicide. So Lord Shiva, he teaches the sincere devotees of the Lord how to practice detachment from material enjoyment. Lord Shiva is very renounced. He, he is often naked, body covered in ashes. He is very great and his renunciation of all material enjoyment is an ideal example of how one should be materially unattached. Lord Shiva's wife, of course, is Sati. We said Sati. Sati is Durga, and she controls material nature. But they have no home. They live under a tree. And although Sati is controlling material nature, and Lord Shiva is Mahadeva, the Lord of all the Devas, they live under a tree. They're so renounced, they're so detached. It is said at one point they built a house. They built a house and they had the Brahmanas come to do the Griha Pravesh and then the Brahmanas requested, you have to give us some Dakshi. We did the Griha Pravesh for you. The Lord said, I have, I have no money. How I can give you any Dakshi? They said, okay, we'll take some of the house. The house was all built out of gold, you see. Mm. So, so they took that, they took everything. There was no house left. <laughs> they, they'd taken everything away from it. So Lord Shiva thought, oh, no more point, I'm not going to build another house. And finished. No need to have houses. So Lord Shiva is very detached and he's teaching us. So Sati, the, her guilt was polluted mind, defilement of the time, negligence of my directions, direction I mean Kashyapa's directions, and apathy to the demigods. Everything was inauspicious. So this was her faults. And then Here's their good qualities, lamentation, penitence and deliberation, unflinching faith in the Lord and adoration for Lord Shiva and for her husband. And the result would be, one of the sons will be a great devotee and her two sons will be killed by the Lord. Okay, draw images. Relevant for Krishna conscious, we has to like. <laughs> we can, we're not going to do that. Present your drawing. Prabhupada explains, during the age of Kali, there is no discipline in sex life. How then can one expect good children? Certainly, unwanted children cannot be a source of happiness in society. But, through the Krishna conscious movement, they can be raised to the human standard by chanting the holy name of God. That is the unique contribution of Lord Chaitanya to human society. All right, so we spoke about the incident between Diti and Kashyapa, how they became involved. They had union at a, the wrong time. We explained about Lord Shiva's ideal example, devotional life. He's very detached. He taught his wife, what Lord Shiva told his wife, of all kinds of worship, what is the best? Aradhanam Sarvesham? Vishnu. Vishnu Aradhanam Param. Right. Of all kinds of worship, the worship of Vishnu. And he taught his wife, no need to chant the names of Vishnu, chant the name of, you don't know this one? Rame Rame Namo Rame Sahasra Nama Bistuyam Sri Rama Nama Varani. Very famous. Lord Shiva told his wife, 
Parvati was going to chant 1,000 names of Vishnu. He said, Don, wish, just chant the name of Lord Ram. One name of Lord Ram is equal to 1,000 names of Lord Vishnu. So Lord Shiva teaches his wife such nice things, you see. Such a great devotee. The qualities and behavior of Prahlad in relation to our personal application. That would be difficult trying to apply the qualities and behavior. <laughs> anyway, examples how husband and wife can cooperate for spiritual advancement and the role of Lord Shiva. The incident between Diti and Kashyapa teaches us about Krishna conscious Grihastha life. The incident teaches us, must be very cautious, must be always remember Krishna, and don't become in influenced by the modes of passion and ignorance. Prabhupada was asked, what is married life like? He said, it's like going to a feast and fasting. You heard that before, right? So married life, the opportunity is there for sense gratification. We have to fast. <laughs> and identify the positive and negative aspects of DT and discuss their results. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Any question? Anyone? Okay. So tomorrow we'll go on. We'll hear about the four Kumars going to the kingdom of God. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.